So thanks everybody for coming. My name is Joseph Goodman. Good evening. since I've done one of these, since I did a scary con this year. So I'm going to cover a lot of stuff. It's going to feel kind of fast, but that's because I don't have room for an hour. So feel free to grab me afterwards or grab any of us at the booth and we can talk about this more. Um, and if, uh, if I don't, you know, if somebody doesn't come up to talk about a project or I don't mention something, it's not because it's not out there or leaving something out. It's just for lack of time. So I'm going to start by asking somebody to come up. Um, Mr. Steve Wick, could you please join me for this? Thank you. Welcome to Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, Steve is the founder of DriveThroughRPG.com. Wow. And I've had a request for quite some time to do a print plus PDF option. And there are other companies that do that out there, and we have found a good way to do it by partnering with Steve from DriveThru. Starting actually now, almost all of our products on the title page will have a little code in the bottom corner where you can go to DriveThroughRPG.com. <laughs> Thanks, Steve, for his help. He helped make this possible. Um, and he's been doing, you know, this internet stuff for quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so I just want to ask you a couple questions. Yeah. Um, you know, this is obviously like sort of a synergy between, you know, print yeah. and electronic. How do you see this Absolutely. kind of playing out between the platforms? Yeah, well, I, I mean, if we took the temperature of the room here, how many people have some of their RPGs in PDF format? <laughs> Yeah, and in print format, I'm guessing that's everybody. Yeah. So, I mean, people love both formats, right? And mm -hmm. and we often see people want to get both formats because both have advantages. Yeah. You know, when ebooks started coming out, uh, everybody thought, are they going to take over? But really, it's kind of worked out that it's almost 50-50 um, in terms of the book market's almost half and half because, you know, if you want portability, if you want the things that update, if you want, there's a bad advantage for electronic, and if you really want this open behind the screen to run the adventure best, frankly, books are great, right? So I think having both this way, you know, that's that's marriage made in heaven. So yeah. yeah, I think it's gonna be great. Cool. Yeah. So I think in something that you know other companies have done this already, and I've done it in limited form mm -hmm. with Kickstarters and so on, but the challenge is that I, I, I believe in retailers, I've always supported retailers. And if a retailer carries a book on their shelf and I say, hey free PDF and you buy online, like that doesn't help them at all. So the benefit here is that you can have this code, which is unique for every book. So in the retailer format, it works online. It works works in every format. Um, and Steve, I know you've had a you know, relationship with retailers since yeah. you started drive through. How do you think they'll yeah. respond to this approach? Well, I, I mean, I can only guess, of course, but I, I have to assume it will be treated really well because it's, well, it's been a challenge for. I, I used to do game publishing before we started drive through RPG, and was that that company called? White wolf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so my brother and I started that back in high school in the 80s. And so, um, and you know, retailers then and now are the bread and butter of the industry, right? That's where it happens. And starting drive through RPG, I of course had some misgivings, and, and a lot of retailers look at us, unfortunately, as somebody that might be taking business away from them, even though that's never our intent. And here we have an opportunity that I'm really happy, so that's why I'm so happy about this, is because now we can allow people to be in retail, buying this where they need to be buying it, and still they can benefit from that PDF delivery as well. So I have to think it's everybody wins, yeah. right? The customer wins, and, and the retailer wins because now they can essentially offer the PDF as a free bonus when you're buying this in their store. So. Uh, what's not to love, and I hope I hope that's the I hope that's how it's received. But you never know. Yeah, so, sure. I think it'll go well. I think so too. Yeah. I think it's great. I, I'm thrilled to do this, um, and, and the value that everybody will get out of it, I think, is great. Um, so yeah, well, let's run. Everybody's going to have everything now. <laughs> so guys, there's a couple exceptions because I have licenses, and some of them don't allow electronic, you know. Uh, distribution, for example, um, some of the con specials, there'll be things like that. But for all the you know mainstream distribution releases, this will be the, the pattern going forward. Um, so you know, thanks a lot for making this happen. Thank you. you you were a key part of this. Hey, I, I, we love running this with you. So cool. thanks for. Yes. <laughs> But nobody noticed. <laughs> 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 so the I noticed this. after I bought the PDF, I noticed. Good job, Diogo. Diogo! <laughs> <Diego! laughs> 
All right, guys, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about 5th edition. Uh, we published a line called 5th edition fantasy, and we continue to support that. So if you came by the booth, you would have seen number 15 at the booth. That line has actually had this print plus PDF format for quite some time, and that was the, the place where we tested it, and there are actually some things that get complicated, so we worked that out. So and we're going to continue to support that line going forward. I mentioned before somewhere that we're also going to do a subscription project for uh, supporting 5th edition, the Friendly Neighborhood Game Box, which will also be offered through distribution. Um, I just want to let you guys know that we'll be working with a fellow named Garrett Shaw. Some of you guys recognize that name. He was the founder of MythWork, which was the very first RPG crate subscription service. So we're still working out a lot of the details, but he will be involved, and I think probably early next year sometime you'll hear a lot more details about that. But now I want to bring up somebody named Mr. Chris Doyle, as well as Mr. Tim Wadzinski. Grab it here, guys. And we're going to talk a little bit about something else. So first I'm just going to, you know, you can... You guys can read. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you've seen Original Adventures Reincarnated, or as we call it, Four. Um, <laughs> every time we need to hit a deadline, Tim goes, Rogue! 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 <laughs> so, I just want to talk to these guys who have been integral to this project and effectively written it and almost completely edited it already. Um, it will come out hopefully in November if things go according to schedule. And uh, <laughs> we're really excited about it. What was that? Nothing. <laughs> so Chris, you know, you obviously did, uh, you know, almost all the writing for this book. Um, and I should say, like, Zeb Cook, for example, is contributing an introduction, and there's some other people involved as well. But Chris wrote, you know, the conversion and so on. Um, what are your earliest memories of the Isle of Red? Uh, not good, actually. <laughs> as, as most of them. Uh, I remember uh, we, I was a party of one, uh, shipwreck victim, no, no equipment, no nothing, no food, no water. Um, it's and like uh, it, it was, yeah, it was really, it was awesome. It was definitely, you know, there were no CRs and ELs back then, so, uh, so we didn't know what we were doing back in the early '80s. And uh, so, but I did discover, uh, you know, an oyster bed. And I'm like, ooh, oysters are good to eat. And you know, so I set myself up and I grabbed an oyster and I found a pearl. And I said, you know what, adventuring's hard, but you know, getting oysters and pearls is easy. So I set my all self up. <laughs> I spent like four hours in our game setting up, getting food and water, and setting up camp and everything. I didn't have fire yet, but I was like, I could eat those guys raw. And, and then I was like all set and everything, and then of course the very next day, got bit by a sea snake and died. <laughs> and that was about the extent of that. I should have mentioned, you're supposed to sell this adventure. I know, but, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to, so. But anyway, so it was great, and then after that, um, I, I never adventured back on the Isle of Dread, I always became a game master, because it was just a great sandbox to play in. Um, it was just the ultimate, like, blank, not blank canvas, but, you know, somewhat filled out camp canvas that you could do whatever you wanted to, shipwreck or, you know, kind of Cthulhu style, whatever you wanted to do was all there, so. That's awesome. And uh, so, describe to me what additional material you created for the class of Module 5 e. Uh, Quite a bit. Um, most of you guys know I like to overshoot my word count. Um, so, <laughs> so there's quite a bit of new material in there. There's all new uh, random encounters. I, I took the random encounter tables and I expanded them and kind of did them in the Watsi format, uh, describing them a little bit more, giving a little bit more oomph to them. There's additional set encounters. Um, on the island, so where the island had 24 um, set encounters, there's now, I believe, 44, uh, including on some of the smaller islands on, on the outer edges that didn't have anything. Um, and then I also uh, created a couple of new levels uh, down underneath the dungeon, uh, under Taboo Island in the center on the, on the plateau. There's a couple of dungeons in there and a few extra levels in there of all brand new material. So, so quite a bit of extra stuff. That's awesome. Um, and tell me what inspiration did you tap to, tap into when you were working uh, Quite a while. That's, I have to admit, this is probably the, the best part of the project is when we finally get the green light because these things are discussed and discussed and discussed and finally it's like, yeah, go! Um, but before that, I get to go and I just get to do like my homework and just look at all the different things that were done for Isle of Dread. Um, you know, obviously uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs um, at the Earth's core was uh, very important to the creation of it. So I actually uh, watched the old cheesy, I think it was the 70s, it might have been the 60s uh, movie. Oh yeah, yeah, the classical one, Doug McClure. Yeah, it's good stuff, man. Um, but it, it worked, it worked. Yeah, there might or might not be a fire lizard in there. That's almost exactly <laughs> like the fire lizard. Um, and uh, and uh, most people know Paizo did a, a whole adventure path um, based on the Isle of Dread, and they actually did a couple articles and they did a bunch of things. So um, I actually looked at some of that material, mostly to make sure I wasn't, you know, copying and redoing any of their stuff. 
um, which was a bummer because the one I was gonna do, like the one adventure, I was like, oh, they already did it. I'm like, oops, so I better not do that. Uh, so, uh, and, and then, you know, again, you just go to the list of, you know, the Lost Continent, Jurassic Park, anything that had to do with dinosaurs, islands. Um, I do have the advantage that in the real world, I'm an aquatic biologist, so I do like the water, and most of my modules tend to feature water. So, um, so that was really cool, being on an island and being able to play around. And you know, Shark Week didn't hurt either. It was made. I see one table that might be. <laughs> so it was fun. That's awesome. You guys knocked it out of the park within the Borderlands, uh, which, by the way, was the all-time bestseller for Goodman Games. The on the day it was announced for distribution sale, it actually sold out. So I had to send a second printing to the printer the second day it was available, <laughs> which has never actually happened before. It was incredible. So there's been a, a huge response to it. We see it popping up in stores everywhere, um, and it's done great. And you know, it's largely you guys doing a terrific job. Um, and this one will be out in November, and of course this is number two, and there are numbers higher than two. So I'm anticipating that it'll be out. I think we can count the web 10 or so. I'm good with 11 or 12. Okay, so, cool. Yeah. All right, we're good. Um, but thanks a lot, guys. You did a great job, and people love us. Thanks for giving the opportunity. <laughs> So now I'm going to talk a little bit about MCC and then DCC. Um, for those of you who came by the booth, let's guess it was yesterday, we actually got the second printing of MCC in stock. And, um, thanks to Thorne for <laughs> basically dragging a sledge from the Embassy Suites to bring all that to the booth. Um, well. <laughs> so we, uh, um, we have the second printing in stock. It also sold quite well, and the first printing is out. Second printing is, if you have the first printing, don't worry, you're not missing a lot. We fixed a couple typos. There's three pieces of art that got swapped out because I just felt like it. Um, otherwise, it's largely identical. But there are two variant editions. The first is what I'm calling just kind of the gold foil, just because the green foil sold out, and there's people who like gold foil as well. Um, and that one will only be available at conventions. I mean, we now go to about two dozen conventions a year. I mean, we've had a lot of success sort of reaching new markets and new people through conventions, so I want to sort of give some sort of thank you to that group. Um, the other new one is a red foil edition, which says on the bottom, Hobby Retailer Edition. Um, and after today will only be available, or after tomorrow, will only be available within retail stores. Um, and it, it, you know, MCC sold really well through distribution. I, it's kind of a thank you to retailers. So uh, if you want the Red Foil Edition, if you don't get it here at Gen Con, you know, for those of you watching at home, go to your local store and they'll be able to order it. Um, the, the next release for MCC will be this year's holiday module. As you know, every year we do a module around Christmas time. Um, it will be <coughs> MCC themed, and Julian Burnick is working on, on that right now. There will be a couple additional modules for next year. Um, and we still have one appendix in license that I haven't talked about much, but that one's actually perfect for MCC. So we'll talk about that next year when it's ready, but that will be sort of the next significant MCC release. One other thing that's pretty exciting for MCC is that there will be a third-party company making miniatures for it. So some of you know um, Andy Barlow, who's here at the show actually running adventures. Uh, he has a company called Dark Plasma Studios, and he's a great sculptor. He actually sculptured for the BCC minis line back in the day. Um, and his company, Dark Platypus, will be running a Kickstarter in late August, probably two to three weeks from now. Um, they're calling it Mutant Mayhem Minis, um, and it'll bear the compatible with MCC RPG uh, logo on it. And he's starting off with uh, 15 character pieces and some monsters. Um, and actually, I have some samples of the booth, some of the castings, the early castings. He's already done a lot of that work. Um, if you come by the, tomorrow, we can show you some of the castings and show you some photos. He's going to try to bring some painted minis by as well. So look for that in August. It's going to be really cool. Um, and Andy's a great guy. Look for Dark Platypus Studios on Facebook if you want to follow them, and you can get more information there. So now DCC, um, the next release for DCC, and by the way, I'm just, I'm moving through the list because it's been like a year since I talked to you guys. So if you've got questions, I'm happy to answer them. Just swing by the booth or talk to me after the show. Um, but DCC, I'm sorry, the next one will be the Halloween Adventure, which Stephen Newton is writing. As you know, every year we do a module around Halloween, just something sort of creepy and horror themed. Um, and you'll see more details on that in about two weeks. After that, we'll have DCC number 99, <coughs> excuse me, which will be the Star Wound of Abaddon. Some of you guys remember that at Game Hole Con, they run a module design contest every year. We sponsored that. And uh, Marzio Muscadere won the contest uh, last year. And so we're publishing his adventure. It's a great adventure, very strong, like Clark Ashton feels, the Clark, Clark Ashton Smith feel, a little bit of HP Lovecraft, really good adventure. I want to talk a little bit about DCC Langmar. So I'm going to flip this. Some of you have seen the Naewon map that Doug did, but. <gasps> If you haven't, it's in some of the downloads you got if you back the Kickstarter. It's really incredible. I mean, and I, I talk a lot about Doug. Doug's amazing, um, but this map's incredible. And as some of you know, um, Mike, and actually, actually, let's just round of applause for Michael Curtis. Park 
with a DCC link mark. If you're a Kickstarter backer, you already got essentially the, the, the core box set, as well as I believe six of the Stretch Goal Adventures. There's I believe two more Stretch Goal Adventures coming, and Doug's also working on his map of Blank Mark, which will be color and really big. Um, but the one that's finished right now is the black and white Nawan map. And you can read about this on Kickstarter, but Mike did a lot of amazing things, but Mike also went back and reviewed every Lankmar map ever published by a game company, compared them to the text, critiqued them and corrected them, <laughs> found the correct placement of several things that have been replaced. TSR made one error, then every company copied that. You can sort of see where it originated. So this is also, this will be the most accurate map of Nawan and eventually the most accurate map of Lankmar ever to be published, which is amazing. Um, anyway, good job, it's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> The other exciting part is you guys funded as part of the Kickstarter um, kind of a crazy trip. <laughs> so Mike went to Houston to go to the Fritz Liber Archives, which is basically a library at the University of Houston, and they have a couple dozen boxes of... Uh, 40 something, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this is like the most exciting trip ever. Please go sit in the library for a week. It's 40, it's 40 linear feet, so 40 if you lay down everything, it'd be 40 feet long. Yeah. Yeah. And he studied essentially all the remaining artifacts of Fritz Liber's life. And he found among there an unpublished manuscript by Fritz Leiber. And, and you can read all about this in the Kickstarter updates, but the short version is Mike transformed this uh, unfinished manuscript into what I believe is some of the first new Lakemar RPG material since TSR did it. No other publisher, we're not the first publisher to do Lakemar, but we're the first to ever have access to this material, and it's really incredible. Um, so I just think it's awesome. So thanks, Mike. Good job. Good job. If Harley Strove is running up here, <laughs> now we get to talk other cool stuff. So first I'm going to flip this poster and show you something that will blow your mind. First I have to describe to you what you're looking at. We actually talked about this, I think, four years ago. <laughs> Typically Harley starts a project, <laughs> rolls it over, <laughs> and then finishes up. What you're looking at here, and actually let me hold this up, is a dungeon map. It includes a spinning wheel with a grom in the middle, so it spins. On that spinning wheel are three other spinning wheels that spin. This is officially the spinniest dungeon we have ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the way it works is gonna be games is, for DCC number 50 I did, um, it, it was a module by Monty Cook, and it actually had a spinning wheel dungeon. It had, I think, two spinners. And Mike did the chain coffin, which had a puzzle that had three spinners. So now Harley is not this game. She's got four spinners. <laughs> but it, it's really a brilliant module. Like, Harley, this is genuinely brilliant. <laughs> And so I, I want to ask you, you know, have you tell us about this? By the way, this will be DCC number 100, I should mention that. Um, which is, and by the way, I think DCC is now one of the top five best-selling RPGs of all time. So between all the modules bearing, or I should say RPG lines, between all the modules bearing the Dungeon Crawl Classics uh, logo on them, we're approaching half a million copies sold. Which, uh, you know, it, it helps have gone through three editions, but you know, I, I'm pretty sure we're doing pretty good, so it's great. And you guys obviously had a huge part, as well as many other great authors. Um, but so DCC number 100, which will be called The Music of the Spheres is Chaos. Um, tell us about this. Tell us the background behind this dungeon with four wheels and why do they spin and all this stuff. Well, so like the last seminar we had, we said no small, no small adventures, and this is, this is a big adventure. And... Um, and so it, it's it the, the story is about um, you know this these this, this this cult of of, of of alchemists that are trying to undo the world and so we give players the capacity to stop that or augment it and so you want to make it real so they, they hollowed out the inside of the mountain and they turned it into this massive alembic. That distills the, the the fires of creation into a, a monster in the very center, um, but it's souls, and so they're calling out to the chaos. They're summoning in these strands, and and, and they're attempting to insult this chaos into a monster that they've created on their own. And so the players, the player characters, rather, um, in order to solve this dungeon, they need to, they they have the capacity to alter reality. That's what you see down here. Like we lean on the dice chain a lot. So when you're in the zodiac of the wolf. You know, warriors do better when when you're in the zodiac of the worm. You know, warriors do not as well, but 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 spellcasters are are raised and then different zodiac. Anyways, and so as 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 the players are actively spinning this 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 dungeon, you know, their their abilities of their of their of their characters are changing. So, 
And then, but as it all goes, like the only way to solve the dungeon is to spin it. But as you spin it more and more and more, you know, it, it, it distills these fires of creation until there's a monster, you know, ready, ready to wreak havoc upon the world. So, and the monster actually destroys the world if you screw it up, right? Yes, exactly. You know, like, <laughs> so don't make any mistakes. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it was just the opportunity to, uh, and we had the permission to go big and to, to, to make something that was memorable that nobody's done before. Um, and, and that's DCC 100. Can't it, wait to see it. This was another one of my classic calls to the printer. So, <laughs> so I think I'm basically going to have to go with a board game printer because I don't know how to do this. But it's going to be awesome once we figure out how to do it. Can't wait. Um, <laughs> that's your problem. <laughs> Joseph has a real problem now. Yeah, it's okay, it's worth that. So, but tell me though, so rotating oh, back changes the, the physical way of the dungeon. Yeah. It also changes the stats. So yes. how's that gonna work? Well then, well we have the dice chain. And so you know you can move up and down the dice chain. And so but it's but it's but it's following this imaginary zodiac and so that um so that uh, you know the, the the player characters they start to realize that when they're when they're in this zodiac, you know, these these powers are stronger and they get Plus two dice or negative one die, or, and so you can you can the players have the ability to tailor the encounters, but it comes at a price, and and and, and so they can how what, how great is that price? What are they willing to pay to make you know these encounters easier or harder? Um, and the dice chain is such a gift for that because we're not tracking modifiers. We're just saying well instead of a d20 you're rolling a d24, or instead of a d20 to hit that monster you're rolling a d12. Sucks to be you, warrior. Good luck. <laughs> um, but you know, but, but the, the math isn't there because we have the gift of the dice chain. So, yeah. so there's epic consequences, right? Like you have to destroy the world. How do you fit this into a home campaign? Oh, um, you know, it's just like Tower of the Black Pearl, right? Like the, the, the seas rise in the Tower of the Black Pearl, it extinguishes all the candles, all the heroes are dead. Um, this fits into a campaign because every campaign has mountains and every campaign has secret cults and who knows what's up in the mountain in there, out there, and who knows, like, they went to the biggest mountain in the world, they hollowed out the center, and, you know, that could be dropped into any campaign. But you want, you want big adventures, and you want adventures that are memorable to us as judges and players, and for myself, like, this is the most memorable one that I've ever had the privilege of working on. It's, it's awesome. Thank you. Well, cool. Thanks, Arlene. Right. I'm looking forward to it. So the next thing to come out one. shortly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a funnel. funnel. It's a zero level. Totally screwed. So this, uh, as you already see, this is the cover to the second printing of the chain coffins. So I think it's been three years, maybe four years since we released it. We were down to like seven copies, and then actually, uh, thank you, Thomas. He's the guy who today about the last copy. So we're officially here for the second printing. Uh, but I just want to let you know that's going to be coming soon. It'll actually be a hardback format and incorporate a lot of the additional material that Mike and others have prepared along the way for the channel. And shortly after that will be... Oh, just, there'll be new material in that. There'll be some new material as well. Yeah, good reminder. We will have, we're going to talk again about the DCC annual, which I was... <laughs> <laughs> coming out. So the next Kickstarter, which will last in a couple weeks, will be the annual, the chain coffin reprint combined into one, as well as the core book is just about sold out again. So I already did four hardbacks, two rounds of softcover reprints. We now have to do the seventh printing, which will be hardcover, and that will be part of this next Kickstarter. I'm not going to do gilded edges and thumb tabs again, because that was a pretty nightmare. It will be a more straightforward printing. But look for that Kickstarter coming soon. It'll be a chance to finally bring this into the world, get the core book back in print, and have chain coffin come back because it's a hardback. Um, so now I want to talk to you about something else. Um, if Mark Bruner could come up, we're going to talk about Dungeon Crawl Classic. <laughs> So you guys know the DCC is based on the works of Appendix N, of course, and one of the most popular authors in Appendix N has, has always been Jack Vance. Um, and his writings heavily influenced the D&D notion of magic. You've all heard the term Vance and magic. Um, and many of his spells were lifted, you know, basically verbatim by Gary Gygax and sort of dropped into D&D. Um, so Mark has been leading up the Vance project for the last year um, with additional help from Bob Brinkman, John Hook, Julian Burnick, and Terry Olson. And uh, the writing is almost done. They're about 75% complete. And I want to ask Mark up here to talk a little bit about it, and maybe, Mark, maybe start by telling us, you know, you've read Jack Vance's Dying Earth several times now. Um, what's your favorite part of the books? 
I mean, is it fair to say the most recent one I've read? Sure. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it is. I mean, every time I read, uh, reread a section, it's, it's like falling in love with it again. And, and, and I recently re you listened to the Brilliance audio that Al Kamori uh, narrates. And you know, just, just going through that again, like, re enlivened my, my exposure to each of the sections of the novel. I mean, I love the, the short novella, you know, short story versions of the Dying Earth, you know, the different sort of picaresque novels of the Google stories. Um, you know, and, and the, the, the reality stories are just, you know, they, they're just filled with just a, an extra level of wonder and amazement. Yeah. Um, I, I think that it's, if I had to pick one, it would, it would probably be that, that Kugel series, just the, like Kugel Clever, just because it is sort of this, you know, Pickwick Papers, um, Don Quixote slash, you know, it's it, it, anti-hero that you don't want to root for because he, he does some bad things, and you, but yet at the same time, it's, he gets his comeuppance in all these things, and, and it, but it's just cleverly orchestrated, and, in, and it's a narrative that format that I love in terms of the secular or secular secular nature, I guess you know where it's, it comes back around on itself. You know, the, the beginning of the story is matched with the end of the story. And I love those types of uh, approaches to, to novels and storytelling. So, and Marcus, you know, internalized Vance in an incredible way. He's <laughs> reading <laughs> *Dying Earth* right now. Um, and so for the past year has been writing and, and leading other guys in writing this sort of fantastic work. I think now that Lake Mars are out in the open and we'll go to the printer soon, I think it's, it'll be, you know, we're close to the time when we can sort of bring the DCC bands into the world and um, let you guys know more. But it, it, it's really been, we've done amazing work so far. Thanks. Um, I mean, the, the team has done, it's been wonderful to work with and, and they're all creative, you know, elements of the team and they've all contributed greatly. What are we actually calling the line? Um, probably Dungeon Call Classics Dying Earth. I haven't fully decided yet, but that sounds pretty good. Yes. B A R or A B R. We'll figure it out. Um, so, Mark, tell us what your thoughts on the term fancy and magic. Like that gets tossed. That gets a lot, right? Yeah. Terms, yeah. The first thing is, you know, fancy and magic. It's this concept that, well, originated, uh, you know, with Gary Gygax appropriating it, you know, for the, the original D and D, where magic users have a fire and forget mechanism for magic. And that's a limited view in the scope of what everything that Jack Vance wrote about in the Dying Earth novels. I mean, that you look at that as an element of what some of the magicians could do. They could memorize spells, um, you know, a certain amount. But they also, they also have this mechanic, this idea that memorizing those spells is, is almost like triggering madness or a level of madness because you know that it's that complex sort of you're driving equations in your mind, you're driving the pattern of, ma of magic itself in your mind. You're and, and, and this idea that there's this, this element of risk associated with it as well is, is, is kind of one thing that, um, you know, is, is Vancean, but it's not really necessarily present in D&D. Then again, you have Vancean magic in, in DCC RPG. You know, there are elements of DCC RPG. There are Vancean. You know, you have this, this idea of madness or this idea of, like, sort of wildness. You have the idea of misfires, right? So when, when Google is trying to memorize a spell and, and recite it, well, he, you know, he has a mis mispronunciation of a word and it reverses itself on that. Well, that's a very DCC, you know, Vancean concept, but it's not present in D&D. So it's, like, it's really just more this idea that Vance magic, or Vancean magic, covers a lot more than just what one system has done with it or that you might think of from the original D&D. It, it carries into, you know, what he did with the Rialto stories, where magic is almost not something that a magician does, but it's something that he has a, 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 a helper, right? A, 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 they call them die hops or sand scenes in the book. But that's like the vehicle or mechanism for doing great magics because it's almost like, well, I'll get the servant to do that, you know, and, I, and, then, and they are the ones that have the ability to pull magic. That hasn't really been explored in, you know, the original D&D or in the DCC RPG. Um, so those, those kind of concepts are, are within that fancy and canon, and it's, and it's, to me, it's really, it's a, it's a disservice to think of it just, you know, just that one element of fire and forget. You know, we want to explore everything that, you know, that, that could fall under that umbrella of fancy magic um, and bring it to DCC. That's awesome. Yeah. Tell me, what other aspects of the Dying Earth books are you adapting to DCC? So, I mean, I think think of this as like almost like a toolkit or source book for your for judges and for the players. Um, you know, magic is obviously a very integral part of the Dying Earth series, and it's almost it's it's almost pervasive, right? You know, you see you see uh, you know the Wayfair Kugel trying to to use it or trying to to steal baubles and trying to to, to use it. Um, we're writing a, uh, about 30 new spells uh, for the DCC RPG game that will be usable by people just in their home campaigns or they could use it in the Dying Earth setting. And these, of course, are inspired by the Dying Earth uh, novels themselves. So you have, you know, a, you know the Dismalish spell that Lugar you know, developed or, uh, you know, the, obviously the excellent Prismatic Spray. And, and the idea, though, being that we want to make it new and unique and different from this sort of 
you know, the values that have been, you know, like you said, Gary Gygax took that, put a version of it in D&D, well, we wanted to take that reflection, you know, look back at it in the, in the mirror of what Dying Earth has and make this version unique, but it's also inheriting a lot of what, you know, has been done before. Um, so the, the new spells would be a great addition to the DCCR RPG game um, that could be used by anybody. Um, new classes, you know, so we are obviously trying to, to take the elements of the narrative and make it narratively appropriate or narratively, uh, you know, used in the campaign. So we have a number of new classes that are going to be inspired by the Dying Earth setting, um, you know, that are, again are appropriate for a campaign set in the Dying Earth or, or you know, within the, uh, any homeworld campaign. The, the great idea about the Dying Earth is that it's got this rich history reaching back millions of cities and, and you know, billions of years and, and it's really, you can, you can take anything from the past and it could be present in this dying or setting again, which is, is a really, really neat and just open-ended idea. Now, and all the all the things that about the dying or that, that is appealing is that, you know, Vance does a lot of sketches, but he doesn't a lot of do a lot of details, and it's and I think we can use that to our advantage and, and bring that that to the DCRPG as well. This would be awesome. Yeah, hope so. Cool. So, like Marvel, go to print. So, you know, once you guys give us your feedback, the PDFs, and we finish like the last two supplements and a couple maps and things. And then hopefully be in print early next year, maybe by Gary Con or so. And then shortly thereafter, we will bring DCC Dying Earth into the world. So, <laughs> so thanks a lot, Mark. Thank you. So next up, we're going to talk about another uh, evolution of DCC that's also an evolution of something else. So if, uh, we're going to talk about X Fall Classic. So Brendan LaSalle can join me up here. <laughs> How are you today? Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, you know, Brady holds the record for running the most games at conventions. He's down to 12 or something at this con? No, no, a lot less. I'm only running uh, around, to you'll be total eight as of tomorrow. Okay, yeah, but that's officially on the books, not counting the two he did on Wednesday. Yeah. Like so, excuse his voice, he, he does a lot of talking. As the, as Sorry, <laughs> I'll do my best. Actually, I was doing great for a minute ago. I, I, I sat down for a minute now. It's like, ugh. Yeah, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I should mention I have a disease. <laughs> we also have don't you fix it too much. <laughs> so anyway, um, so x crawl has been around for quite a while, about 10 years ago, or 10 years now. And uh, you know, x crawl I'm sure you've all heard of x crawl It's sort of the classic mix of extreme sports, pop culture, dungeon crawling, and magic. Um, Brendan's been playtesting a DCC version of x for the last couple of years. At this point, he's worked out um, you know, the vast majority of the mechanics, um, playtested several crawls that run really well in the DCC rules. Um, he's written about 50 to 60,000 words in the initial manuscript. I mean, we're moving steadily towards getting to the point where you know, it can enter the world. So I wanted to have him just tell you guys a little bit of x Classics. And, uh, and maybe you've been running playtests now um, for several years. What's your favorite sort of in-game playtest story? Something that actually happened in you know, X-Crawl Classics. Um, all right, well, uh, I had a character in that early one play. He's like, so I want to play um, a uh, kid who's actually like dying of some really bizarre disease. And uh, my last, my last, my, my Make-A-Wish Foundation wish is to go ahead and actually die in X-Crawl instead. So they walk around, and I was like, what? what it, it was such a bizarre thing for someone to want to do, and it made the gameplay hilarious, because you know, like everyone's like, like you know, we'll go on, do great. <laughs> but I think it really points to um, a lot of people will just run x Pro as, a, as a, a convention game that um, doesn't have a whole lot of background in like a like. <laughs> I was doing great. Yeah, I was doing great. Okay. Last seminar, I did really well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it speaks to how um, x Pro can also be a unique role playing situation as well not just slam bam, complete over the top crazy action, which it absolutely is. <laughs> <laughs> you want a back rub? <laughs> so, so for existing DCC players, um, what's it gonna be like to drop their characters into x crawl Because the whole goal of these stuff is, you know, as much as we want to evoke pure Lankmar and pure Dying Earth and, and x crawl in its purest form, I also want there to be a portability element between the worlds, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And you can choose how you play these campaigns. But what would it be like to take DCC characters into x crawl Well, um, it will be absolutely compatible. Um, if you play a campaign that has real, like, x crawl is the game. x crawl is the game, the death within the world that people do in touch. 
So you'll find that in DCC characters, we'll probably do better in world in adventures that take place outside of the DCC arena, but in the world of Xcrawl. But they won't do as well in Xcrawl itself. There will be Xcrawl specific characters that are going to have um, a lot of extra abilities and that are really tailored to it. Um, specifically, like the wizards, like we have blasters instead of wizards, and they're uh, battlefield magicians, and you're going to find that they're uh, spells, they don't have that high level cosmic level that, like, wizard, that you know, um, uh, that regular DCC wizard would have, but instead they have, uh, they'll have very tactical spells that will really help in a dungeon set. Okay. Now, you know, you've playtested several x crawl classics adventures, so tell us what a level zero funnel would look like in x crawl. Well, <laughs> so last year, I was, I was struggling with this last year, and I was talking to Val, big wave, and I was like, I don't even know what it would be like, and Val was just like casually like, what about, like, x has got talent, and I was like, the first character, the first funnel that's going to the core book, which um, we will be announcing sometime soon. As soon as you finish writing, it'll be a good time. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know what? It's, um, it's getting more done, and it's getting done faster and faster as it's more coming to me and such. So it's going to have, um, I'm projecting 60 new spells. Uh, it's going to have, uh, I think, 11, 11 new character classes, and they will all be fully compatible with DCC, but again, they will be, the, the, my, my goal is to make them all slightly better in an actual x crawl setting, and slightly worse than their other counterpoint points in a, a regular role setting. And I gotta say, when I heard, you know, x got talent, like, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect way to bring x crawl into the funnel. Uh, so tell us about the magic system. How's that going to be different between sort of DCC and x um, It will be completely compatible. Um, but again, like the, uh, the, the high end of some of the DCC spells, that cosmic level of some of the spells hit, completely break x crawl and wouldn't work. And also, in the world of x crawl, you wouldn't let a wizard that, the, the powers that be, wouldn't let a, wiz a wizard that powerful risk their lives um, for the games. Um, they're too important as tools of statecraft, you know? Wizardry is really used to help suppress the masses and keep them doing their jobs and watching TV like the masses are supposed to do. So instead they have the, the blasters that are a lot more expendable. So like, say that the wizard spells sleep, you know, at the maximum level of sleep, which everyone's achieved at some point, you know, through Spellbar and everything else, you know, you can put, you know, a thousand, you know, you know, get, you know thousands and thousands of people to sleep and such. It would ruin the games. Everyone watching at home would be like, how come everyone in this game is laying down? And the audience, and the referees, and the guy parking the cars, and the planes flying over here. <laughs> it, would, it, would, it, would, it would destroy cities, you know? So instead, no, none of the spells are gonna have that highest level cosmic, like, upper shelf, but they will have some really interesting, like, um, you know, like very tactical things that will help you, like, uh, do specific things. For example, um, Rather than Fireball, Fireball is great. You know, you can do a lot with it and such. Um, so we're going to have the third level, you know, the closest analog to it in uh, the x magic system is a spell called Smart Bomb. So Smart Bomb, it does less damage than Fireball at every level and has a smaller radius. But even at the lowest level, the wizard is immune to it. So he can drop it on himself and get people exactly in this area. And at higher levels, he can but actually pick out which targets take damage, which targets don't. And the highest level, he can actually steer the smart bomb at 240 feet per round, up and down hallways, and can see through it. So we can actually make it chase people down, and run them down and such, even into the parking lot if need be. Yeah. <laughs> which is very useful in extra ball, as we all know. So that's, so that's awesome. one example. So it's gonna be awesome. I'm really excited to see thank this you. come about, so thank you so much about it. Thank you. Now I'm going to quickly talk about some other projects we're working on and you know, show you guys some, some cool art. So some of you may have seen this already, but here's the cover for the Cthulhu alphabet. A couple years ago we did the dungeon alphabet and then the monster alphabet. This will obviously focus on the works related to H.P. Lovecraft and the Cthulhu mythos. Um, Michael Curtis and John Hook have done a lot of the lead writing on this as well as a number of other writers. Um, uh, Rick Maffei, Mike Ferguson, Brendan LaSalle, Brian Cordovanch, and Brad McDevitt, who had the original idea for this and sort of fleshed out a lot of the original table of contents and wrote quite a bit as well. Um, Brad's also going to do a lot of the art and has already done a lot of amazing art. Um, and this cover is by Earl Otis. So this will be coming probably early next year. Um, and based on 
you know, most of the writing is complete and they're in the art phase and it's coming along great. It's gonna be awesome. Now, um, you've all seen, hopefully, Tales from the Magician's Skull, which is the work of fiction that we published in collaboration, for, or I should say, largely fiction with a, a small bit of TCC stats at the back by Terry Olson. Um, you know, part of this goes back to the appendix in legacy of DCC RPG, and it's fun to be publishing um, classic swords and sorcery fiction that is you know, in the vein of much of the appendix in uh, material. The, uh, the, the editor of that line is Howard Andrew Jones, who's really an amazing guy. Um, you know, like if you think you know anything about the Pendix Inn, you should just go hang out with Howard for a while because he has an incredible recollection of a vast amount of literary material. He really is like an incredible resource. Um, something they, uh, I believe they officially announced this, but he's actually, he's also got a new gig going on. He's actually going to be the new editor in chief of the new line of Conan novels. So we have a really great asset to be working on this, this product. Um, but I also wanted to let you know, we've released issues one and two, and issue two at this point has shipped all the Kickstarter backers. Actually went out this week, so you should get it probably next week sometime. Um, but we will be doing a number three, and we will be offering subscriptions. It's, it's gone really well. We've gotten very positive feedback. People like both the fiction as well as the stats. Um, and then frankly, the art and the layout, too. And I should give a shout out to the, the graphic designer, Lester B. Portley, who did an amazing job. We get a lot of just amazing comments on how much that magazine feels like weird tales when people pick it up and look through it. And, he really just brought it to life in the right way. Um, something else to talk about is Judge's Guild. So hopefully you guys all bought our coffee table. I mean, our book, which was volume one of the collector's edition. Volume two will be uh, the Janelle Jaquay's uh, edition. So this is just a scan of one of the issues of the Judge's Guild journal that was recently completed. A lot of this project is restoring old material. So we're going back to the archives, pulling back a lot of the Jaquay's material, um, scanning it, restoring it, and so on, and, and in some cases looking for the multiple different printings or the variants or things like that. So volume two will have Caverns of Thracia, we'll also have the Book of Treasure Maps, and Dark Tower. It'll also have the first six issues of Dungeoneer, which was the original publication um, that brought Janelle Jaquays into the, the Judges Guild poll, and of course some Judges Guild journals as well. Um, and then possibly some of the miscellaneous material, Bob Bloodsaw Jr. actually uh, showed me some just like distribution uh, pamphlets they used to send to distributors that would have illustrations on it that were never seen by consumers, things like that. So this will be coming out probably late next year because it takes a long time to put together one of those books, but it's, uh, it, 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 it's something I'm really excited about because it's just a really impressive volume and has a lot of cool gaming history in it. Um, and then Metamorphosis Alpha, so we will continue to support that. There's another manuscript that Jim Ward wrote called uh, Death on the Warden, which he described as Tomb of Horrors in Space. So <laughs> that's coming into the, the development queue soon. I mean, we, we just kind of, we had a lot to do, so things are moving a little slower than I like, but that will come out probably sometime next year and, and be available at that time. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the road crew. We have about 15 minutes left. And, uh, you know, the road crew is something we've always done. We call it the world tour and the people who participated in the road crew. Um, for those who don't know, if you run the DCC games or really any of our products in the public setting, then you can get a lot of free swag. So that includes uh, running at you know, your local school, your local con, your local bar, your local library, or of course your local game store. And we have a lot of people who do this. There's a, you, know, you go to our website, there's a little link on the right hand side or down at the bottom if you're on a phone and it, it actually has this picture um, or something like this, I forget the exact icon. But, and you, know, you click there and you can say, you know, I'm running a game and here's the location and we will ship you out a bunch of swag. The more games you run, the more swag you get, and it's really just an incentive to support people who are sort of out there sort of publicly playing the games, and it gives you some free stuff to give to your players. And it ranges from at the lower levels, you know, if you run one or two games, you might get some pencils or some dice or, you know, some bookmarks. As you go higher and higher up, you get like the dead stamp, or you get a big belt buckle, or you get a little custom pin with your name on it, and some really cool stuff. Um, so the road crew has grown every year, and we sort of made it a little more sophisticated. It used to be an email dude, <laughs> <same stuff. laughs> now it's like, you know, you can order it to the store, and all fancy. Um, but we're, we're running about two times the run rate last year. There's effectively twice as many people running road crew games this year, um, which is awesome. I actually, I ordered the swag for this year based on how many we went through last year, and I've already had to reorder like, most of the swag for a second round, which, which is awesome. So thank you to all the road crew judges for all their just yeah. playing games. And so we, uh, we sent out a survey about a month ago to everybody in the road crew, which was you know, a very simple sort of online survey asking for feedback. And I want to thank all the road crew judges who completed that. It's, it was really good feedback, and it's good to get, you know, uh, you know, we get comments on message boards and things like that, but it's good to have a vehicle to actually hear directly from people. Um, and there are a lot of really good comments. So a couple of things we're going to do immediately. I'm um, actually already fixed. You should be able to, it, 
some of you may not know this, what this means, but for those of you who played last year, if you played a certain number of games, you got a little name tag that had your judge name on it. Um, we will be adding that again this year. There was actually just a bug in the online store, so it didn't pop up. But if you go to the online store, that should now be fixed. So you can now, if you run, I think, 13 games with the name tag. Um, there was also a suggestion that we should be able to give uh, Roku judges free quick start rules to give out to their players as they introduce new players, which is kind of like, why did we think of that? So um, basically, within a couple weeks, as soon as we get a chance to do it on the website, uh, Roku judges will be able to re request free quick start rules and we'll send them to you to give to your players, which is a great idea. Um, and those are things we can do really quickly, but there are a lot of other great ideas too. Um, people added or suggested adding a mapping option. So if you say I'm playing a game in Atlanta, and he says I'm playing a game in Colorado, and he says I'm playing a game in Jersey, so it actually map where the games are being played so you can find a game near you. Um, so we're going to try to figure out how to do that using the internet. But uh, <laughs> we did that. I think Google Maps has some built-in functionality, so we should be able to do some of those things. Um, there was a suggestion to add a shared calendar, which I thought was an awesome idea. So you could see what Roku games are being you know, played next Thursday near you, things like that. So we're going to look into that. Um, a way to link up game reports. A lot of people post game reports online, but if there's a way to sort of directly link that into a, a common platform or on the website or something, other people have written that. So there's just a lot of really good feedback. So we're going to you know, try to integrate a lot of this. They're really good suggestions. Um, and something else I liked the idea of was a road for zine. Uh, there's a lot of zine support for DCC, and it'd be cool to have somebody come forward and publish a road crew zine in whatever format that takes, and you know get suggestions from other road crew players, and have game reports and section reports, and write articles about your stores and things like that. Um, so if there's people out there interested in you know helping with these things, whether it's a zine or programming or mapping or something, let me know. We'd, we'd love to do some of this with road crew. Um, the other really exciting thing is if you well hopefully hopefully a lot of you guys played in the tournament this year. We're having a great time with the tournament. It's going really well. Um, Last year, we had another tournament, the first DCC tournament in this format that we've run, uh, the Black Heart of Faculon the Undying. And you can buy that module right now at the booth. So if you pick up that module, you know, one of the exciting things about tournaments is you all can play it. You can all share the same experience of playing this adventure, score yourself, or find out your score, I should say, and then compare your scores to other players. And of course, if you're at Gym Con, you advance or don't advance. Now that the module is in print, you can do that at home. So once you pick up this adventure, the scoring guide is in there, so road crew judges, really anybody, but road crew judges can run this for their own teams. So what I'd like to do is we're going to pick a month, it's called probably September or October, and encourage everybody in the road crew, as well as everybody else, but to run this adventure in a tournament format, and we're going to compare the scores nationwide. So you can see at home how your team, you know, everybody thinks their, their local game group is good. Now you can find out for sure. You <laughs> <laughs> can find out how the score compared to the Gen Con pros. And if you pick up the... That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> now you can document that. <laughs> so you'll be able to pick up the, the adventure at our booth or in stores in a couple weeks. And if you go to the inside cover, either one of the inside covers, there's a little URL. Go to that web address that we've already created a form where you can input the scores for your local group. So we're going to publicize this, make it an organized thing. You can play with your local group, and we're going to post those scores online and give you guys a chance to sort of have the real DCC fighting society and compare your results against everybody else. I think it'll be a lot of fun. And I love the idea of a model for the future of people running sort of similar tournaments you know, across the country, across the world, and sort of comparing their results to Gen Con. Look at all these perfect scores. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we're going to talk about that. The prize might be a free trip to Gen Con, an automatic placement in round three, and those who flub their scores will be instantly slaughtered. <laughs> I'm just joking about that, but we, you know, right now there's no prize other than the honor system, um, but we're going to see how this works out, there may be some sort of prizes or something in the future. Um, the other thing to let road crew judges know is that, you know, Goodman Games, we go to about two dozen conventions a year right now, but that includes some that we don't necessarily talk about publicly, which is often distributor open houses and the gamut trade show and things like that. Um, Brett's actually going to the Alliance open house in just a couple weeks. And these are um, what we call behind the scenes events. <clears throat> For those of you in the road crew who are interested in sort of you know piercing that veil and getting to know the industry a little better, we do occasionally need help running um, DCC events at these industry events. So you'll see more and more calls from judges. It, you know, it helps to be in the right area. You know, Alliance is based in Fort Wayne, ACD is based in Madison, et cetera. But as we have these events, we'll place calls and people want to come help us out running uh, DCC events for retailers, for distributors, for professionals, that opportunity will come up. The last thing is just an idea. So I had this idea. The idea is DCC Day. And I don't yet know what format that will take, but some of you know that I was involved in the creation of Free RPG Day a long time ago. And I love Free RPG Day, and it's really cool. And I think it'd be really cool to have a day where everybody runs a single common adventure, and everybody or has options to run similar adventures, and it's the first time you've all seen it, and everybody shares that experience, and we give you a bunch of stuff for free, like who doesn't like that. You go to your local store and get to meet new people and so on. So 
sort of percolate this idea in my head for a DCC day. And if you guys have sort of thoughts or suggestions on what form that could take, let me know. And hoping to bring that, whatever that may be, bring that to life in 2019. So I think that's actually all I have to talk about. We have nine minutes left. Um, they'll actually kick us out in like four or five. But if you guys have any questions or anything, I'm, I'm open to answering questions for the next couple of minutes. Yes, Mark? What's behind the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> actually, the... Uh... <laughs> Next adventure. <laughs> <laughs> to be determined. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Yes. can ever be brought to justice. <laughs> <laughs> That's DCC 200. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? All right, cool. Well, thanks, everybody. It's been a great gym time. <laughs>